Welcome to another episode of the Intel with Greg Cosell. I'm Jeff Mosher alongside Adam Kaplan. And joining us as always is Greg Cosell. He's the man that provides the Intel. What's going on, Greg? Jeff, what's happening? Mr. Kaplan, how are you? Good to see you. Good, good, good. We are going to do, we're going to talk today about defensive tackles leading up to the NFL draft. Clearly a position that the Eagles are addressing somewhat in free agency and bargain buys. And, uh, but Obviously, a position they put a lot of value in in the draft, as do a lot of NFL teams. So we will get into some of the guys that are out there that are that we're going to uh, have Greg size up for us. So just to recap, we've done edge rushers. We've done cornerbacks. This will be defensive tackles. And then next episode of next week, we will get into skill position players, r- running backs and wide receivers. Let us start things off with this episode uh, on the guy that everybody talks about, Greg, whether it's on the field or off the field, uh, where he's had some issues there, but we only get into the tape study with you. He's Jalen Carter from Georgia. Uh, I don't have to tell you that the projections are all over the place because of what he's gone through legally, but as far as a player, he is uh, obviously one of the best prospects at the position. So what does the tape tell you about him? Yeah, I mean, he's not a mystery. He's a high-level prospect. He's got you know, every trait you were to look for. I mean, I remember last year, okay, last year at this time when Georgia had, what, seven or eight guys, as I recall, that ended up getting drafted Mm -hmm. and that were coming out. And every time you put on the Georgia tape on defense, which I had to do and watch games over and over simply because they had so many guys, the player that stood out was Jalen Carter, and he wasn't even coming out. Mm -hmm. So Jalen Carter is, um, you know, He's got athleticism. He's got quickness. He's got explosiveness. He's got strength. He's got power. Um, He pretty much has everything you look for. He can line up in multiple positions along the defensive front. You know, he's a disruptor, but he's also a playmaker. Um, You know, he has plays uh, every year. We've seen the last two years that are just special plays where he literally just physically manhandles offensive linemen. Um, You know, he's got that explosive element to his game he's got range he's got closing burst uh he can play in one gap fronts he can play in two gap fronts um he's he's a pretty complete prospect as a defensive lineman um again none of us know how all this will play out adam you know that certainly better than i but there's really not a lot that's missing in his game from a tape study perspective just going back over the years, I know people were loving it with Quinn and Williams uh, when he ca- came out uh, for the draft, and it took him a while, but obviously he's become a very good player. Does that? I guess Quinn and Williams' final year in college was incredible. We're not comparing like the style, but just remember your tape study of Quinn and Williams. Was it was it pretty high, like Carter's? Well, it's interesting you mentioned Quinn and Williams because I like Jeffrey Simmons more than I like Quinn and Williams coming out of college okay. and Simmons obviously was drafted later in the first round uh, due to the fact that he had an ACL injury, as you guys remember. Um, and obviously he's turned out to be a great pro as well. And he and Williams are different players because Simmons is more powerful and country strong. Whereas Quinn and Williams is a little more of a looser athlete. Um, Carter probably is a little of both, you know, it's, it's, he can be really strong. I mean, as I said, there are examples of Carter just manhandling offensive linemen, just throwing them away. You know, the term mm-hmm. that's always used is control and displace. Um, he can do that, but he also has the quickness to beat them as a gap penetrator. Um, so he's probably a little bit of both. Uh, my guess is he would be seen as a slightly better prospect than both. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, again, that also could be in the eye of the beholder. Greg, I I don't know if this will be a trend uh, in the NFL, but obviously what the Chiefs have done with Chris Jones, because he has the ability to obviously beat people as an interior rusher, but also an outside rusher. Do you see that at all in Jalen Carter? Could he uh, occasionally or even for a game or two line up as a 4-3 DN in nickel and and beat offensive tackles? Um, I don't think. Jeff, he would do that, you know, for 35 snaps. I think you could put him out there on occasion, which is what the Chiefs do. Chris Jones is not really a DN, but he right. will go out there, you know, only four or five snaps a game. And if he gets a sack out there, we will remember it. So we think, oh, he's playing the end a lot. But, it, you know, they don't really use him as a DN that much. Um, uh, to, it, that would be a matchup and opponent specific. Um, Carter can do that. Carter can go outside um, and, and, you know, and, and play the end. He, he, you know. 
he has pretty good length. His arm length is over 33, so it's pretty good. Um, you know, he's 6'3". He's not long in a strict sense, you know, 6'4", 6 6'5", 6 those guys. You know, he's not long like someone like Josh Schwett is long. Mm -hmm. um, but 6'3", is still pretty good height. Uh, but he can do that, Jeff, for sure. But I think most people would see him as a D tackle. But in today's NFL, with all the multiple fronts, D tackle could mean he could line up in five different D tackle positions. Mm, right. So, Greg, moving on here, a guy that had an amazing combine and when we talk about speed, but I don't know how much of it transfers to the next level, but I know you've seen him. That's Kalajic Kansi out of Pitt. Yeah. What's the tape show you? Yeah, Kalijah Kansi, is, he, he's an interesting player because the one thing you see immediately when you put the tape on is he, he basically looks like a running back. I mean, he's mm. got th that kind of, of juice to him, uh, and it shows up immediately. I mean, he's another guy that, you know, he's 280 pounds. So you know, you know that his game must be built on quickness and suddenness or explosiveness, or he really couldn't play, or we wouldn't be discussing him, you know, because he's not 315 pounds. Um, there's no question that is what consistently shows up on tape. He's got outstanding first step acceleration and explosion. He's got great contact balance. Another term everybody likes to use, which he has, is reactive athleticism, meaning, mm -hmm. you know, that if it doesn't happen right away, he can change direction in a heartbeat. He can react to what happens and still be explosively quick. Um, you know, say what you want about a 40 time and what it means or doesn't mean. But when you're 281 pounds and you run a four, six, seven, that's pretty good. Um, I think so that's tight end time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's it better than some tight ends, yeah. by the way. I think yeah. it was better than Michael Mayer, if, if, if memory serves me correctly, but I could be wrong. There um, you go. Uh, but, you know, that's what he is. Um, and, you know, I think that he's got quick, violent hands as well. I think he played stronger than his size. Um, you know, it's interesting. You, you think of someone like Ed Oliver when he came out of the University of Houston. And he was also, what, in the 278, 280 range, guys, as I recall. Isn't that right? I think yeah, he was small, yeah, definitely was small. Correct, yeah. I think he was yeah. right around there. And, and Oliver's been a nice pro, but the difference is, and we don't know this with Cansey, but I think it will be the case, is Oliver is not a natural pass rusher. And mm -hmm. even though he can make some great plays and really look explosive at times, you know, he's up now for that second contract and he may not get a big second contract because he's ultimately not a pass rusher and when you're 280 pounds and you're playing inside and you can't rush the quarterback then teams have to decide what kind of value that is in today's nfl mm -hmm. whereas Kansi can rush the quarterback and he will my guess is he will be able to do that at the nfl level he has really uh, an explosive way about him and i think he will be able to rush the quarterback at the nfl level Greg, when when I hear you say that, and I you know was observed him at the combine, and I knew the scouting report on him. There are certain players to me that sometimes scream Philadelphia Eagles, right? Because you know what the Philadelphia Eagles look for, and they do deviate sometimes from their analytics right. and, and traits. Um, this guy, sort of, even though he's more undersized than normal for a, for an even for an Eagles defensive tackle, he he just sort of screams to me like the type of guy that Eagles would covet. Is well, it's that, interesting you say that, Jeff, because. How much do you think Brandon Graham weighs? Oh, man. He's probably at what? 250? 255? Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, they played him inside at times over the years. Um, you know, and certainly the last two years when, when Gannon was the coordinator, and we assume that Sean Desai won't do anything dramatically different. I mean, you know, we don't know this for sure, but I think one reason they hired him was he's not likely to make dramatic changes in the way correct. they play defense. Right, Adam? Isn't that a fair statement? Correct. hundred percent. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, you know, they, they do play lighter guys inside in different fronts mm -hmm. and, you know, Cansey is probably a guy, let's say the Eagles drafted him. He, he's not going to play 65 snaps a game as a rookie. You know, he would play in given situations because he can rush the quarterback, and they'd probably line him up inside. You know, there were times, by the way, at Pitt that he lined up outside as well and mm. rushed the quarterback as an edge rusher because, wow. you know, he is he is capable of doing that. Now, he doesn't have the length you ideally want, but, but again, you're not going – you wouldn't be asking him to do that on a regular basis. I mean, his arm length is less than 31 inches, which, you know, is not considered great, obviously, right. certainly not for an edge player. But this guy is is an explosive interior athlete. He's got great first step burst and explosion. Um, hmm. 
you know, and, and he plays a little stronger. I mean, even in the run game, I noticed that he he was really good stalemating double team and combo blocks. He was not getting driven out of the point of attack. He's wow. just a really explosive athlete, um, despite just being 281 pounds. Hmm. Interesting stuff on him. All right, let's move on to Clemson's Brian Bruzzi. I believe I pronounced that correct. Brise. Brise. It's Brian Brise. Brise. Brian Brise. Okay, Brian yeah. Brise, who, if I'm not mistaken, was kind of a big-time recruit for them ah, uh, a couple of years ago. He wasn't a big-time recruit for them, Jeff. He was the number one recruit in the country, That's what I thought, regardless yeah. of position. Yeah. Hmm. Wow. Yeah, so so has that tape sort of justified that label, or or what do you see from him? Well, you have to understand, because of injury, an ACL, shoulder injury, uh, personal tragedy. He lost his sister to cancer. I think she was 15 or 16 years oh, old. That's terrible. Mm. He's only played 915 snaps in three years at Clemson. So he's not played a lot of football. So, But when you put on the tape, you know, you see certain things that, you know, you can see why he's – a guy considered to be a a potential first round pick you know he's six five and a half he's 298 okay mm -hmm. he ran a 486 think about that at 298 pounds um he's pretty explosive off the ball he's got great balance really good body control he can bend he's flexible um you know there's certain areas he obviously needs to improve but that would make sense and i think you have to understand when you draft him what can be taught because and in high school, and I actually saw some 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 clips, I guess, went viral a few days ago where, you know, he was just better than everybody. He didn't have to do anything <laughs> from a technique standpoint. Um, and then he didn't play that much at Clemson. So he's probably just clay waiting to be molded. There, there's a <laughs> lot he needs to be taught. You know, his, his hand usage is very erratic. Every once in a while, it'd be really good. Other times it wouldn't be. But he was probably not taught a lot about that because he missed a lot of time. And it was the kind of time with injuries where he couldn't be on the field. When you tear your ACL, you're not out there practicing. You know, it's not like having a slightly sprained ankle. You know, so, <laughs> you know, he just lacks significant game experience and therefore reps. He's not played a lot of football. Um, now, he plays a little too upright at times. Um, some people believe you can fix that. Some believe you can't. That That's a legitimate question. Um, I don't know the answer to that because, as I said, there are coaches who don't know the answer to that for sure. Um, but the good plays, you can see why he was the, the number one recruit in the country coming out of high school. You know, he can two gap with strength to control and displace. He can one gap with quickness to penetrate gaps. Um there's a there's a lot on tape, even though it's the sample size is not large, to say that this guy could be a really good player with coaching and development. Hmm. All right, as we move on here, there are two By Byron Youngs for this draft, one from Tennessee and one from Alabama. How about the guy from Alabama? I love the one from Alabama. Love the one from Alabama. Um, he played multiple positions along their defensive front, both in 21 and 22. Um I think most teams will see him as a D tackle, um, six, three and a half or six, three and three eighths, 294, really good arm length at over 34. Um, you know, I think that you can play him as in, in, in um, even fronts as a gap player. You can play him in odd fronts as a two gap player. Um, I think that he's got, you know, positional versatility has become really big, as you guys know, for D-linemen, uh, particularly interior D-linemen, because everybody thinks D-tackle, but there's like four or five D-tackle position, depending on the nature of the fronts. So um, I think he's got really strong traits. I think he's got off-the-ball quickness. I think he's got point-of-attack strength. Um, I think he had really refined hand usage for a college player. Now, keep in mind, this guy played four years at Alabama. I think we probably all would assume that when you play four years at Alabama, you probably get pretty good coaching in those four years. Um, so I I really like this kid. It would not surprise me at all if he was a day two pick. Um, you know, you're not hearing a lot about him because he didn't really become a full time starter until this past season in 2022. But of course, that's because Alabama has you know a ton of five stars that they just keep throwing out there. So sometimes guys play a lot of snaps, but they're not starters. But I, I really like Byron Young from Alabama. I think he's got what it takes to be a really good pro. Should add this. He his hand size and Lucas Van Ness at, both have eleven. They're the, the they're the biggest hand size of any defensive lineman. D, D or D tackle for this draft. Mm. They probably have a tough time buying gloves then. 
Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. They have to get X, double X. <laughs> Greg, our next prospect we have some familiarity with. We have family familiarity because the Eagles already have his brother, Marlon, on the team. But oh, yeah. apparently younger brother uh, might just be even better of a prospect. Tui. Tui Pelosi Tuli. from USC. Tuli. Yeah. Tuli. 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 We'll go with Tuli. Um, now, he's a different player than than his older brother. Um, because this kid is a more athletic guy, and he's another guy that lined up all over. Um, my sense is he's a defensive end, not a defensive tackle. Oh. 6'3", 266. Mm. Um, now, again, his arm length isn't isn't big, but can he play D-tackle? He did line up there at times. He also stood up a lot as a joker and kind mm. of would walk up, walk back, walk up, and then attack inside. But, you know, I think – you know, you know, when I watch all these guys, and I'll, we'll get to his traits in a sec, one of the things I think about, because obviously I don't work for a team, is how they would transition to the league. It's one thing to say, boy, a guy is quick and he's fast. You know, a lot of us can see that, you know, but what what's he going to be in the NFL? And my sense is, to me, that he's a D end in a 4-3 front or an outside linebacker in a 5-2 front, like the Eagles play, with the ability to move inside and sub fronts. That's the way I see him. Now, this kid is naturally quick. He's got power. Um, he can defeat O-linemen both ways. Um, he's a movable chess piece, as I said. Um, you know, he's kind of a an explosive moving guy who generates power. And he, he jarred offensive linemen a number of times, creating space for himself. Um, he's a really interesting player because there's kind of a, a looseness to his movement. You know, he's... Like I said, I'm not sure he's a true D tackle because just the way he moves. Um, but uh, that will be probably be team specific and how they see him. Just like I said, you know. But but he can rush the quarterback. He led the nation in sacks. Most of them came as an edge rusher. Most of them, mm -hmm. not all of them, but most of them. That's interesting, wow. Greg. I wonder if you know there are teams that value versatility, but then there's also the idea of you want to know. Right. where your player is going to play and be able to play 65 to 75% of the time. I wonder if there's a question on where he best fits. If you, if you move him around, then you still need to put other players in positions where he's not playing well, as opposed to having your three down defensive tackle or defensive end. And, you know, and keep in mind too, is um, as you guys know, and cause you know, everybody always says, Oh, he can play five different positions. Well, uh, you know, yes, some guys can, but, when you get a rookie and they come in and given, you know, the collective bargaining agreement and the fact that there's less time than there, you know, was years and years ago, as far as coaching, you have to teach a guy how to play something, you know, cause it's a, still a jump. doesn't matter what conference you come from. There's still a jump from the NFL, from college football to the NFL. And you've got to teach a guy, you know, how to play a position in your defense with all the, the nuances and subtleties and details that go along with it. I mean, you guys know, you talk to coaches, you know, I've talked to coaches who say, well, we, we have 10 versions of cover three, which probably means they have 10 versions of cover four, which means <laughs> they have 10 versions of this and 10 versions of that. And, you know, you got to teach guys all this. So while I think positional versatility is definitely something a lot of coaches want now, I don't know if that's the first, that's not the first thing you're teaching a guy. Gotcha. As we move on, there's a guy that you wanted to make sure we talk about, and that's Jacqueline Roy from LSU. Jaquel, I believe it's Jaqueline. Jaqueline, okay, Jaqueline Roy. Yeah, because I think the way it's spelled, you don't you don't want to you don't want to say it's Jacqueline, Adam. You know, you can go I tell know. him that yourself. Might I'm not going to tell him that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> say yeah. say his name again. I think it's Jaqueline. Jaqueline, got it. Thank you. Yeah, Jaqueline Roy Jaqueline from LSU. Roy, Jaqueline. He's a guy. You know, I didn't know much about him at all. You know, L LSU obviously always puts players out. I mean, that's that's their deal. They're they're you know they get players, they go to the NFL. He actually came right out of high school, right on the LSU campus. There's a high school called University Lab High School. It's on the LSU campus. Mm. Um, and uh, you know, he was a four star and he stayed home. Now, this guy to me, I, I loved his tape. And like I said, I knew nothing about him before I started watching him. Uh, he is a really good athlete. He has light feet. He's got great quickness off the ball. He also showed strength in a confined space to control and displace interior alignment. Um, 
And those combination of traits allowed him to be successful both as a one-gap penetrator and as a two-gap player where, you know, you have to hold on and control an offensive lineman initially before, you know, to see what the play is. Um, so, again, another guy that probably could play in multiple schemes because of that. Um, I think he's at his best right now watching his college tape as a run defender because he's got great short area quickness and strong, heavy hands, and he plays with his arms really effectively. You know, arm extension is really important. You want to keep your legs clean. Um, but I think he showed pass rush traits, and I think that that will be something he will further develop as he you know, gets into the league and is coached and just, you know, continues his development. I thought he was one of the – it wouldn't surprise me, let's put it this way, if three years down the road – He's one of the more complete three down tackles in the league and from this draft. Hmm. That's an well, I really like that. this kid's tape a lot. We got to make sure we get that name right then. Jaquelin Roy from LSU. Jaquelin, yeah. All right. You mentioned how LSU produces a lot of good defensive linemen, good defensive players. Another school known for producing a lot of good defensive linemen, the Eagles have had a few, uh, is Michigan. And every time they played this past season, Greg, ah. you couldn't help but hear the name Mazzy Smith all, all game long. Tell me about Mazzy Smith guy's a freak um <laughs> he's 6'3 323 and you know i knew his name because you know we all know bruce feldman he had him i think number one on his freaks list like a year ago mm. you know he does that freaks list every year yeah. college players which i'm sure you know we're all familiar with bruce does a great job with that um you know this kid he is truly you know i don't say this a lot okay he's got a rare combination of size, mass, and athletic movement. I mean, he's 323 pounds, okay? Got long arms. But this guy plays like an athlete. I mean, you put the tape on and see this guy move. You know, I'm talking laterally. I mean, he's he's almost, we don't use this term for defensive lineman, but he's almost twitchy for a mm. defensive lineman. Yeah. I mean, he's quick, he's fluid, but yet he's big enough and stout enough to physically dominate with strength. Um I don't think there's another D tackle prospect in this class, including Carter, with the size, mass, life, feet, and short area explosiveness of Smith. I think he's a pretty rare prospect. And to put something else on that, he had the best bench press of 34 reps. That at 225, right? I think it's 225. Mm. Something like that. Yes. That's and and, yeah. and something to keep in mind. This is important in my opinion. He played 49 snaps per game versus Michigan's 11 power five opponents. So we're not talking about a guy that comes in, plays 15 snaps, looks great and sits. Mm -hmm. He played yeah. 49 snaps per game versus their 11 power five opponents. So he's used to playing a lot of football. What What mm. is separating Mozzie from being considered the number one or number two defensive tackle in this class? I don't know. I'm just telling you what I think. I don't okay. know. I don't know the answer to that. I thought after I finished watching this guy, I was thinking to myself, why is he not being talked about as a top 15, at least a top 20 pick? And again, don't forget, you guys know how it works. You know, uh, Jeff, I don't, I know Adam for longer than I know you. So I know how yeah. Adam does his draft work by, you know, setting up calls and talking to people. I don't know if you're doing the same because yeah, we, we do the same other as long, but once coaches start to get involved, everything changes, mm -hmm. you know, and, and then all of a sudden you start to see the draft gurus say, so-and-so is mm -hmm. moving up in the draft. That's because they talk to a coach who's finally starting to watch these guys. <laughs> right. 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 Adam, that's the way it works. Yeah. Yeah. The, the moving up draft boards thing is kind of comical. It it rarely happens folks. Right. It's not like the, the like GMs decided to start studying in, in April. Yeah. Right. You know, it's just a lot of coaches haven't watched yeah. guys because, you know, they, they they have to be involved in free. It's like when you go to the combine. I mean, I talked to a ton of coaches at the combine, as I'm sure both you guys did. And, and a lot of guys I know well, they say, gee, I just I've only seen eight guys at my position because, you know, I was doing free agency. So now after the combine, they see 30 guys at their position. So they see more guys. Mm -hmm. You know, I can't answer that, Jeff. I wish I had a brilliant answer. I'm just telling you what I saw on tape. And again, if there's no red flag about the kid with his character, personality, anything along those lines, I, you know, which I don't know because I'm not interviewing the kids. I thought this kid's tape was really, really strong. Um, you, do you guys remember Don Terry Poe coming out of Memphis? Oh, yes. Sure. From Memphis. Memphis, right. huge. 
who, by the way, ran a four nine seven forty because I was on the field at the dome when he ran it. And I was like, I remember that. I didn't know the time as soon as he ran it. I just knew it was pretty damn fast. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like thinking, wow, Mozzie Smith to me, number one, he weighs a little less. And, and Poe is the 11th pick in the first round, by the way, by the Kansas City Chiefs. So I kind of see Mozzie Smith in a similar fashion. I, I really think this kid has kind of rare traits. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. Well, we'll see what what becomes of him. Poe was 11th. I think Fletcher Cox then went 12th to the Eagles. Right. Yeah, after. That the same draft. Yeah. Wow. Poe yeah. went higher than Fletcher Cox. Wow. Okay. Yep. I actually remember we were at the Novacare complex one day because the Eagles brought in a uh, free, like a veteran free agent. They were thinking of signing. And I don't know if this was intentional or not, but they, they had Jim Washburn and Don Terry Poe was visiting that day, walk through the media. They want, they clearly wanted us to see Washburn with Don Terry Poe hmm. and Washburn said, Hey everybody, check out my friend Fletcher Cox. He was making a, a joke. Uh, but we all looked, and and you saw all the reporters looked very confused because he did not look like Fletcher. Yeah, <laughs> Two right, guys right. built completely funny. differently, but it was pretty funny on Washburn's part there. All very right, nice. Let's, let's move on to the next prospect. Let's talk about Baylor's. I'm going to hope to not butcher this name too poorly. Shiaki Ika. Sounds about right to me. The Ika part sounds pretty good. Um, now this was a guy, and and. To be honest with you guys, I may have to go back and watch a little more because I I'm not I didn't love his take. Hmm. Um, and, you know, again, I'm just telling you what I thought, which doesn't make me right or wrong. But that's what I thought. Um, he's a big man. He's got a lot of mass. I mean, he's six, three, weighed three thirty five. OK, um, I think his game is built on strong, heavy hands. He's got powerful arm extension to control and play off blocks. But he's to me, he's more of a confined space player. He's a straight strength and power D tackle. Um, every once in a while, you saw a flash of lighter feet and quick lateral movement. And then I said to myself, OK, is that something that can be further developed? Can he become more than a kind of a confined space player? Um, I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, I, I would imagine different people will have different points of view on that. Um you know, I kind of felt like an apt comparison when I was finished watching Eakin. Like I said, maybe I have to see some more. Would be Linville Joseph. You know, Linville Joseph was drafted back in 2010 by the Giants in the second round with the 46th overall pick. And obviously, Philly fans are very familiar with him. But what he essentially was in his career was a kind of a confined space, strong, deep run stopping, deep tackle. And at his best in his prime, was really, really good at it. I mean, with the Giants and then in those years in Minnesota, which more people probably remember, he was really, really good at it. But, you know, he wasn't an explosive athlete. He wasn't making plays, you know, down the line of scrimmage or, or you know, with great lateral movement. I mean, that wasn't his game. And there's a place for those guys in the league. Uh, you know, I, I guess that becomes team and scheme specific. But I didn't think Ika at this point, watching his tape, I didn't think he was much more than that. So he's definitely a zero technique. This guy is a nose tackle, a zero. He's to me, he's, he's a, a two technique in, you know, he's not a three technique. He's a two technique in a two, Mm -hmm. which means you're lining up head up over the guard, a two eye, which meaning you're one step further inside a one technique, which means you're kind of one step off the center and a Mm -hmm. zero technique, which means you're head up on the center. So he's a two technique in. Keanu Benton from Wisconsin, Greg. Yes, he is next. On, actually, he is on my list. Keanu Benton, Greg, what do you know about him? Yeah, he, I studied, uh, he's, I like him. Um, you know, I think he's one of the best interior D prospects in this draft. He's got a great combination of size, length, power, movement. He's about 6'4", weighs 309. He just looks the part, you know. Um, he's got arm length, 34 inches, basically, and he knows how to use his arm length particularly one arm length. He's really, really good. Um, uh, I would say the foundation of his game is more strength and power, but the more you watch him, the more you see movement. But he's got really strong, heavy hands. Um, When he stayed low, now one issue is he had popped up at times, but when he Hmm. stayed low off the ball, man, did he show much more quickness and explosiveness in his overall movement. He showed some pass rush ability. They lined him up at three technique at times where he showed a club move. He was also used as a looper in the stunt game from three technique. 
I, I think there's a lot there with this kid. Like, like I think there's more to this kid just based on tape study now. And I, I know it's all projection and what a guy can be two, three, four years down the road. And this is where teams and coaches can make better judgments than I. But I think Benton, there's more to Benton than someone like Ika. I think Benton is, gives you more down the road and even more on tape right now. Hey, I'm, I'm curious since we brought it up. Uh colleges so this kid plays at wisconsin known for producing a lot of good defensive players you know especially linebackers and linemen michigan we talked about greg uh, iowa tight ends and, and offensive linemen. Right. when you when you watch tape and you're putting on a player from a college known or a coaching staff known for producing really good talent at specific positions does that jump out at you like their technique their refinement compared to guys who are playing who are maybe more raw to the position or from a school that doesn't a smaller school doesn't, you know, right. just churn them out. Does well, that jump out to you? Sometimes I will look to see who coaches a position mm -hmm. because, you know, I'm just curious. And, you know, sometimes I have no idea who it is. And sometimes I go, oh, yeah, that guy, I, I, I know he's been here, here, and here. You know, um, you know, and, and if, if it's someone who's really done it for a long time with a really good reputation, you know, then I, I sort of take note of that. Um, you know, someone like Benton in Wisconsin, you know, he uses his hands really, really well. My guess is somewhere along the line, he was taught that, mm. you know, so, uh, but sometimes I do do that, Jeff. And, you know, and sometimes it pans out and other times it's like, oh, I have no idea who that is, you know, <laughs> so it's, 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 you know, it just depends. Gotcha. But, uh, but there's no question that you can see when guys know how to use their hands for, if we're talking D linemen, which we are D tackles, you can see when a guy has a sense of how to do it and the subtleties involved, where he places his hands, how he uses them. You can see that. And that does come from coaching. Awesome. Okay. Good stuff. Um, we're going to round this, this out with three. We got three guys left that we want to ask you about. And instead of going one after one after one, I'll throw the names at you and you give me a little bit of a compare and contrast. Tell me what schemes that you see them the best fit for and, 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 and traits, right? We have Zach Pickers from South Pickers, Carolina. Yeah. Yep. Is it? I believe it's Ger Gervon Dexter or Gervon Dexter from Florida, right? And Cam Young from Mississippi State. Um, Cameron Young is is he's another guy that is really interesting to me because what he was asked to do in college is nothing like what he's going to ask to do in the NFL, and mm -hmm. that's where you have to extrapolate now and say, okay, what are his traits? What can he do? Because Mississippi State played a certain kind of defense, um, and without getting into all those details, but you know you see it on tape. So he didn't get the opportunity to show his strengths as an interior D lineman the way you'd see him in the NFL uh, because of what Mississippi State did. But the more you watch, the more you saw his traits, and he's got tremendous arm length. Um, he ran really well for a guy who's 304 pounds. Um, I think that he can be a one-gap player and a two-gap player. I, I'm very curious to see where Cameron Young gets drafted because I think he can be a really good NFL player. You know, when I say really good, I'm not suggesting he's going to come in, you know, be Fletcher Cox in his prime. But I think he has traits to be a really good player. And I think he'll be an ascending player because of what he was asked to do in college and what then differently he'll be asked to do in the NFL. So that's young. Okay. Um, the other guy is Zach Pickens. Pickens is um, long, 6'4", 291, tremendous arm length, really good athlete. He ran a 4'8", 9", at 291 pounds. Um, another guy with really, really good traits, um, but he showed flashes. You know, the more you watched him, you saw – you saw really good things and you saw some things where you said, Hey, he's got a bunch to work on because I have too many things in my weaknesses section for Zach Pickens, hmm. but it's all there from a physical and athletic and traits perspective. Um, but he does not play to his traits as often and as consistently as you would like. And too often and too easily he got moved. Hmm. So someone is going to draft him and say, I can fix all that because he has great traits. Um, I think early in his career, he'll, he'd be a base defense guy. Yeah. In some ways, he kind of reminded me, um, and this guy got to play a lot for a good team later in the year in base defense, Zachary Carter for the Bengals. And he came out of Florida um, a year or so ago. And, you know, I think that he's going to be like that guy. Then there's Gervon Dexter, who's one of the most fascinating and frustrating watches okay because <laughs> this kid is 6 6 3 10 he ran a 4 8 8 okay um it's crazy 
you know, the term I would use is enigmatic. I mean, given his size and athletic traits, sometimes you watch him and you go, this guy's Chris Jones. Other times you watch him and you think he couldn't be Chris Jones's little nine-year-old brother, you know, <laughs> um, you know, but this guy is a really higher level athlete for his size. Um, he's got athleticism. He's got explosiveness. He can play with strength. He can play with power. Um, but he was laid off the snap a lot. That always bothers me when guys are laid off mm -hmm. the snap, particularly when they're defensive tackles, because the ball is right in front of them. Mm -hmm. um, too often, he looked really sluggish and lethargic getting out of his stance. Um, and then because of that, he lost all his quickness and explosiveness off the snap, which, of course, negatively impacts both your power and your quickness. Um, you know, I thought, you know, then he, he came off the ball too high, um, something that can't be fixed, as I've said before. So there, there's a lot there athletically with this guy. Um, but then there's just too much that is frustrating. So, you know, I, I think that somebody's going to take a chance on this kid because it's there. The tape mm. says it's there, mm. but it just isn't there enough. And, and the problems are real problems. Mm. You, you guys know this. We all, because we talk to coaches, th there's always going to be that one coach that says, Oh, give me this kid. I Correct. can get it done. Yep. You know that's coming. You know that's coming. It always happens. You know, keep in mind, I'm sure both you guys remember when Chris Jones came into Mississippi State, he was a second round pick. No mm -hmm. one questioned the, the traits, but people said, you know, he didn't, get, he didn't, he wasn't competitive Effort. enough all the time. You right. know, the, the usual, and, and obviously he's turned out to be a great pro, and you don't hear that now. Um, and, you know, there's all, but, but Adam's a hundred percent, right. There's someone who's going to look at Gervon Dexter. There's, there's a D line coach in the league. Who's going to look at Gervon Dexter and say, you know what, give me the kid. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm going to fix this kid that it always happens. No doubt. And at every position, by the way, every, every position. position. Oh yeah. Yeah. True. Yeah, true. Great point, Jeff. You're hundred yeah. percent right. Well, that was a dozen defensive tackles that we just ran through there. Uh, a lot of great intel, a lot of guys. Now you've got me, even though he's a Michigan guy and I'm supposed to not like Michigan guys as a Penn Stater, you got oh. me really intrigued about Mazzy Smith because I, Craig, was I, I came incredibly into intrigued, wondering the same thing. Every Michigan game I watched this past year, and it was more than just Penn State, I watched more than a few, including the, uh, the BCS games, I, I kept thinking – this guy is incredible. Like his name gets called on almost every single play, almost like a linebacker, right? Who's range make a yeah. tackle here. You well, just heard his name. He had more. Think of it this way: he had more tackles for a D tackle, which usually they don't have many tackles uh -huh. than any of these other guys by a wide margin. Amazing. So I mean, he made play. He wasn't just like, oh wow, this guy looks good. He made plays. Um, uh -huh. But, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm actually going to even watch a little more just because I feel like it. And I want to study their corner, DJ Turner, a little more as well. Um, mm -hmm. But, um, no, Mozzie Smith, I, I, I'm so curious to see where he gets drafted, Jeff, because I can't imagine teams not looking at this guy and thinking, wow, this guy is he's oh, a pretty rare guy. There, yeah. There's an oh, – he, he had an off-the-field issue. Uh, oh, okay. So, yeah, the, it just he, – they, he, they just – clubs said, as, as I understood, they just have to get through the information, feel comfortable right. with it. But the – this kid, boy, I, the, the information you have, Greg, is a lot stronger. I, I've 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 done a little work on D tackles, asking some people. My goodness, great! They, I mean, it sounds like the way you're talking about this guy might be the best player in the draft. Yeah. No, I don't want to say that. I, you know, <laughs> the top I just, ten guy. Yeah. I mean, I well, know the reason I think I'm so excited is because I knew nothing about him other than his oh, name. Oh, cool, right? Cool. So well, when I put the tape on, it was like, okay, you know, you know, I had no, you know, look, obviously, guys, I don't live under a rock, so I know who players are, but I try not to, you know. To hear what other people are saying if I if I don't know much about a guy. Yeah, you right. Know? So when I put his tape on, I didn't really know anything about him. Can right. I see this question? Of Other than the Bruce Feldman freak list thing, that's all sure. I knew. But I know you don't do rankings, so let me turn it around this way. Of all the tape, of all, all the players you've seen so far, is he one of the best players overall at any position you've seen on tape this Ooh. year? So far this year. I'm just saying this year. Yeah, I would say that, I would say that he falls closely into that category, yes. Okay. Fascinating. He's got rare traits for the position that he plays. Fascinating. Great stuff. Thank you, Greg. Next next episode, we got wide receivers and running backs. It's going to be a really good deep dive into some skill position players. That's going to do it for this episode of the Intel with Greg Cosell. For Adam Kaplan, I'm Jeff Mosher and Greg Cosell. You've been watching the Intel with Greg Cosell.